Okay, welcome back everyone. I am a harsh taskmaster. Uh, welcome back, everyone. If I could uh, beg everyone's indulgence, I believe that there are evaluation forms out there for feedback forms. Uh, we would love to get some of them back um, by the end of the day, just so we know how things have gone from your perspective, uh, if you have any ideas or suggestions uh, for uh, the future. Uh, once again, I'm Joshua Human. I'm the curator of programs, or of uh, education and public programs uh, at the power plant. Uh, we are delighted to continue our afternoon session uh, of this symposium titled Constructions of Time, Still and Moving Imagery. Uh, we will continue with two presenters and then a respondent uh, who will also uh, run a moderated Q&A with these two respondents and invite Leslie Hewitt back to the stage as well. Philippa Ramos is editor-in-chief of Art Agenda and is a lecturer in the experimental film MA program of Kingston University and in the M Res Art moving image of Central St. Martins, both in London. Ramos is co-curator of Vidrome, a program of screenings of films by visual artists and filmmakers. In the past, she was associate editor of Manifesta Journal, curator of the research section of Documenta 13, and coordinator of the most beautiful Kunsthalle in the world project at the uh, Antonio Ratti Foundation. She's the co-author of the book Lost and Found, Crisis of Memory of 2009, and is working on a reader on writings <laughs> on animals to be published in fall of 2016. Following Philippa, we'll have Jean-Paul Kelly as an artist exploring the relationship between materiality and perception. The videos and exhibitions that Kelly makes pose questions about the limits of representation by examining complex associations between found photographs, videos, sounds, and online media streams. By working through these documents, Kelly seeks to illuminate the gap between physical matter and the subjective experience of it in the world. His work has exhibited at CGP London, Dilston Grove, the power plant, and Vox Populi in Philadelphia. Uh, as well as other Toronto venues and other international venues. Uh, he has been a resident at the Delfina Foundation in London in 2015 and the International Studio and Curatorial Program in New York 2015-2016. He received the 2014 Kazuko Trust Award from the Kazuko Trust and the Film Society of Lincoln Center and the 2015 Images Festival Award. Recent screenings include Vidrome, International Fe Film Festival Rotterdam, New York Film Festival, and TIFF. And lastly, but not least, our respondent and moderator of the Q&A, Rebecca Comey, is Professor of Philosophy and Comparative Literature at the University of Toronto. She has published extensively on continental philosophy, psychoanalysis, and contemporary art, with particular interest in the aesthetics and politics of memory, trauma, repetition, and the archive. In 2016-17, she will be a Chancellor Jackman Fellow in the Jackman Humanities Institute at the University of Toronto, working on a project called Arrhythmia of Spirit, Hegel and Interminable Analysis. She is currently engaged in two large book projects, one called Dictionary of Indestructibles on Theories and Practices of Iconoclasm, and the other called Deadlines on the Strange Temporality of Deadlines, whether they be political, theological, psychoanalytic, economic, and others. So you'll see all those people in order, plus Leslie Hewitt during the Q&A. Uh, so please, uh, Philippa Ramos.
Thank you very much for being here. Let me put this down. Um, and thank you very much to the power plant for hosting me and inviting me to, to be here, and in particular to Julia Pauli for the very exciting invitation, and also for putting me like in the middle of a sandwich between two amazing artists, that it's very exciting, but also a very big responsibility. <laughs> Generally, people want to hear the artists, so they're like, come on, <laughs> you think. But yeah, thank you. Um, a sense of um, uncanniness traversed my body while I was going through Leslie Hewitt's exhibition, Collective Stance. I had already visited this exhibition in another moment and under very different circumstances. I couldn't recall where or when, but I already have, I've been here already. And in particular inside the black room that hosts the two screen um, film video installation entitled Structures. Well, Leslie has um, spoken about it, so um, I won't go around it. There's a phone ringing. I guess it's not for me, or um, it was my own timer, because I'm putting the timer and I couldn't, I, I was like, there's a phone ringing, sorry. <laughs> um, and I, I perfectly recalled the experience of observing persons, places, figures, um, from a doubled point of view, at the same time that untitled structures, um, this doubled, sense that the, the installation offers. The set of two images are presented simultaneously, yet they're not following the modernist desire of complementarity and fragmentation somehow, but they are actually constituting an apparatus that almost offers the possibility of seeing two at once. This almost was what impressed me then and, and now the most. Um, And it continued to cause an impact um, because to see both images properly, my human, very frontal uh, system of vision needs to pan from one projection to the other, sometimes encountering similar environments, places or persons, and at times slightly different ones, and in other occasions even very different figures altogether. And such juxtaposition and the possibility that is given to the gaze to flow from one to the other while still being able to see both images entirely at the same time huh, has the capacity to introduce cracks in time. Cracks in which a, a story can be told, memory can be built, recollection can happen. These images and the very concrete cuts between them are quasi-portraits, I'd say, images that recall other images, images that tell the story of how images entered history, and that attest how history was fabricated through images, and that show how the invention of memory, or the discovery of memory, even written recollection, was rooted on the visual. The images portray the fissures, the cracks in time, that allow us to see time passing, as when a train slowly moves across a bridge and across the two screens, moments apart one from the other, arousing both the impression of the already seen and the fear of oblivion. oblivion. And it is, it is exactly about that experience, located between the déjà vu and the forgotten, in which a pre-existing recollection added itself to the event of seeing, and seeing them now, let's say, and about the space that lies in between that I'm going to talk about today. And as a condition of the guest, I bring my own story to tell, and I hope that it will resonate with all the stories and all the impressions that have been told and shared here. Some years ago, I developed a project which was entitled The Absent Spectator. And it was uh, an attempt to review exhibitions that I've never had the chance of seeing. I wanted to test the possibilities of using the format of the exhibition review to address the processes of edification of cultural memory. 
attempting to comprehend the dynamics of neglectfulness, of resurgence of nostalgia and of canonization that are at the heart of um, exhibition studies. I also hope to explore in, and to comprehend in which degree did the disciplines of art and exhibition histories relied on secondary literature and on photographic documentation. And ultimately, to test the speculative and why not the fictional vocation of art criticism, and in particular while adopting a format that many consider to be exhausted or obsolete due to several procedures and interests associating to um, what is generally defined as the crisis of art criticism. Many questions arose during the course of this exercise, both in relation to its method and to its ethics. Was there any possibility to observe the unseen from the point of view of the absent spectator, I asked myself? And if so, was the researching subject limited to the condition of a mediator, of that who sees through the eyes, who thinks through the thoughts, and who feels the impressions of another? And what sort of advantage might an absent spectator have? Would it be possible to go beyond the description of spaces, of procedures, and of objects? Might critical judgments be elaborated? Could the historical present tense be used, opening a direct relation to the past? And could the interaction of the absent spectator with the unseen exhibition activate new memories? Ultimately, could it bring certain features to light that needed a temporal and most likely geographical distance to fully emerge? Beyond these queries, I also had mixed feelings in relation to the gest gesture of approaching non-seen exhibitions through the format of the review. Part of me considered it an abuse, as it stood against what I considered to be the basis for a committed approach to an exhibition. For it was enabled of taking consideration one's bodily presence and relation to an unfamiliar spatial arrangement that needed to be occupied, needed to be traversed, and needed to be lived. It couldn't grasp the temporal factor, the need that you have when you see a show, to give and to spend time, allowing an exhibition to gradually unfold and to disclose its rhythms and its times. It also bypassed the experience of effort and pleasure that comes out from giving one's attention to the different elements that are encountered. And it deposited all the exhibition's access in its visuals, disregarding, for instance, its oral or tactile features. It created another exhibition, the show of a show, a static version made of still frames, made of moments that were crystallized in time, that imposed a way of seeing, a prism, an optics, that left unseen much more than what it offered to vision, a partial, selective, amputated version. After all, exhibitions are not significant details illuminated by a flash and fixed forever. But another part of me believed that a review could be a mode of viewing again, of re-viewing, a sort of time capsule to observe the unseen and to investigate the gesture of appropriation which seemed to be inherent to the relation with historical documentation, trying to pinpoint that specific moment in which something alien becomes proper. I also saw it as a tribute to all those projects that I never had the occasion to see either to, due to chronological or to geographical reasons, but that I consider to be fundamental for my own thoughts about exhibitions and about art, transferring the significance of the curatorial back to the caring sense of its etymology. Not having visited these shows I was writing about, and some even took place before I was even born, my research was largely based on the balance between primary and secondary sources, 
documents of the exhibitions, their catalogues, reference materials, photographic documentation, testimonies of those involved in the making of the project, as well as members of the audience, alongside critical texts, reviews, and other accounts written about it. The amount of available documentation and testimonies wasn't in some cases enormous, yet there was still a fairly good quantity of undigested primary sources to make this research exciting and relevant. Yet, I quickly started realizing that most, what most conditioned my relation to these exhibitions were the available photos of them. The visualization of these environments offered peaks of intensity that triggered my desire to precipitate myself into them and to try to verbally recreate the non-lived. Finding photographic documentation of these shows became a fundamental part of my research. I collected and digitized as many photographs as I could with a very bipolar um, gesture of one hand having the jealousy and passion and eagerness to have them and to collect them as I was enthusiastic about sharing them. The unseen sections, fragments and angles of the exhibitions became blank spaces, open to my projections, open to my dreams, which I struggled to fill in order to achieve a complete picture. It was as if these images allowed me to see the show in every way, to live it from all its sides, to be in that place in all possible ways, all the time, due to the simultaneous vision of those images that were in front of me. I started asking myself if photography was so clearly shaping my bond to these moments, could it also be that it was determining my relationship with the overall past? Could I have been initially attracted to these exhibitions due to the existence of photographic documentation about them? Or even more, due to the quality of the images that documented it? And if so, also considering how over time photography has radically altered the way we look at ourselves and the way we look at what surrounds us, by consequence transformed our relation to culture, also determining what was forgotten and what instead um, remained and is recalled. How strong was what I called the love affair between the canon formation and photogenie, considered the, the aptitude of an exhibition to be photographed and consequently its potential for producing an excitement in our human perception and condition our retrospective um, reception. And in what ways can we actually talk about uh, the photogenic quality of an exhibition? I started also, um, and as a parenthesis, I started also thinking about these issues, not only relate, related to this exercise of the absent spectator, but also considering the, the writing of, and the writing and the, the, the institution of the canon of um, um, art history and of exhibition studies in general, and asking myself how is it possible that some of the most essential figures that have defined the canon of exhibitions haven't, at least that I encountered, uh, considered their relation to photography when considering this history of um, exhibitions. In our current times of accelerated and of massive circulation of, of images, we already discussed this a little bit throughout today's session, um, in which an exhibition's display strongly accommodates and considers its photogenic potential, exhibitions, artworks, installations that are arranged at the light of the photographic, um, Another parenthesis, recently I was uh, with my students installing a midterm show and there was a student that was installing things in a really awkward display that looked very wrong. I was like, why are you putting this like this? Uh, as you were mentioning, the curator being <laughs> trying to interfere. And, and she was like, because I want to photograph it from this angle. You know? So this intention that a display is actually a support for a photo that will circulate, that will be, so the, 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 present, the presence becomes secondary in relation to uh, the future documentation of, of something. 
Um, and considered for the widespread distribution of the images they generate, as I was mentioned, I wondered how documentation, and in particular photographic material, mediated the show, how it conditioned and how it determined the way it was, in which it was received and evaluated, how it contributed and determined the reinscription into the present discourses about curatorial and institutional practices, and how it supported the insertion of a project into the studies and histories of exhibitions and accompanying literature. And in what degree did it become an important factor for the insertion, ins, insertion of a certain exhibition within the wider discourses of canon and counter-canon and their relevance for the consideration of institutional frameworks? While I certainly don't detain the answers to these questions, even if I believe that the relation between photography, photogeny, and the writing of the histories of exhibitions is certainly one of the less explored and more exciting areas of the encounter between curatorial studies and visual cultures, something surprising happened in the process of moving these materials from the past to the present, replacing a potentially nostalgic gaze with writing as a form of projecting. During such gesture, my memory started embracing anarchy. I started being unable of distinguishing what I had actually visited from what I had only seen and read about as happening when I was visiting Leslie's collective stands. I could describe very well and very accurately a display that had been made 40 years ago, much more precisely that something that I had theoretically seen months before. And too often I cancel from my mind fundamental sections, if not entire shows, and I was unable of recalling a single thing in them. Initially, I thought it was associated to some source of very practical, almost economical selective memory that my brain was devising with age. A process of only registering what really interested and excited me, discharging all the rest. Yet very soon, unfortunately, this proved to be not the case, as I had an equal amnesia for things that I had expressed enthusiasm for and for those that I had left me completely indifferent. The present situation is an all too easy target to blame for my state of confusion. After all, my research was already being done during the pre period of transference from the analog to the digital in which images film and video documentation, and materials of all sorts multiplied exponentially, emerging from all the dusty drawers and folders directly to the internet, its abundance generating a vertiginous sense of permanent accessibility to the context they documented. At the same time, not only images started, started multiplying and their access became much easier and faster, but spatial displacement was also highly increased and transformed. My own relation to the exhibitions I visited, and for which I often travelled miles just to see them, became gradually more ephemeral and unrepeatable. Let's put it in the less museums, more shows, to just to find that briefly. I was certainly seeing more, and I was accumulating the biennials attended, the shows visitors. I was also writing much more, reflecting with and about these exhibitions, comparing them with others, seen and unseen, that had made a strong impact on me, falling in love and falling out of love for them, with them. At the same time, I was also reading much more what my peers had to say about these shows, seeing them through their eyes, imagining the spaces they described, the solutions they had engendered to turn the visual into the linguistic mode of experience, attempting to stand in between the seen and the sad, and the said, and in the middle of all this, I feel I lost the capacity to distinguish the lived and the non-lived. My memory had clearly gone adrift. So I'm checking time taken by the overabundance of images and data at my disposal. An effect 
that was enhanced by my hypermobility and by my ephemeral moments. The going to the museum was giving way to the temporary experience of the event and I was becoming more and more disoriented, often recalling better the unseen than the actual scene. Yet this was not due to a morbid, nostalgic taste for the past and a lack of enthusiasm for the present, but because the effort and the exercise of translating the image to the verbal, of giving substance and of filling the gaps of a phantasmagoria, were turned into a mind-body experience that inserted my body and my senses onto a space of projection that became well impressed in my mind. Using reviewing as a mode of dreaming and um, also incentivating others to, to do so, and I, I should open the parenthesis, as, um, as it was said in the introduction, I, I, being an editor and commissioning constant writing about art, I'm constantly inviting other people to invent new formats to write about exhibitions that go beyond the traditional review that often echoes um, official texts and press releases and just thinking if this format can still be meaningful and if so, in what ways and what kind of narratives can you introduce in, in, in um, art writing as a practice. So using reviewing as a mode of dreaming and as a gesture of poetic alienation that could, has the huge potential of expanding the possibilities of the lift as a mode of self-induced vertigo led me to believe that the distinction between the imagined and the experience can be truly crashed and challenged by writing even within such a well-coded and canonized system as that of art, art history. And in relation to this, I'd like to recall um, the, the utmost cliche of the cliches when talking about um, images and their reproduction, uh, Walter Benjamin's notion of aura, which often has been misinterpreted as an issue with the object when I believe it's actually addressing the, so so the social change which is triggered by the technological transformation, being property of the social relations in which artworks are viewed, the aura changes, reflecting how technology has transformed and affect these relations. Well, this also implies that technological changes in the ways we relate to artworks and exhibitions can lead not only to a different reception of images, but can also lead to a different degree of relation and projection by losing their distance and being ever accessible, omnipresent, circulating. Images can be entered, they can be lived, they can be appropriated, transformed and stimulate new possible experiences and endless possible experiences. Writing in the era of the intimate, of the tactile, of the quasi-physical contact with images, and Fionn made those beautiful examples of how we can actually have the traces of our, and digital comes from the relation to the finger, so of uh, the, the digital imprint in our searches and our quests. And writing in the era of image mobility, different but nonetheless related to the inherent mobility of the so-called moving images. And even writing in the present condition of the memory impaired has the capacity to grasp such transformation and make use of its potential to dilute the seen and the non-seen, the lived and the non-lived, constituting new discursive, active spaces of freedom where the loss of memory allows for a present continuous, I am living, I am seeing. As a conclusion, and a sort of postscript, um, I wanted to confess that after much effort, I actually realized that I had been inside Leslie's untitled structures before. It was also in an outlandish scenario, above the Arctic Circle, in the Norwegian archipelago of the Lofoten, where I was very impressed by them, as I was now 
for the first time once more. And I even wrote about it and I had totally forgot about it. So it was a, a, a big pleasure to think about and to think with Leslie's work in general and in particular with that um, um, moving image installation and, and to bring these, these reflections and to see how these reflections married with, with her work. And this is it. Thank you. <laughs>